I am really thrilled to welcome you to Women's Health Goulburn North East Showcase for 2023. This year is a particularly significant milestone for us as it marks 30 years of our work in the region across Goulburn Valley and the northeast of Victoria. So we're looking forward today to sharing conversations with friends, both new and long-standing, um, and showcasing our past, um, our present, and some of our future work um, throughout the day. And um, some of the things that we're looking at today is we've got our historical work over here, we've got some of our current work here, and we're looking at some of our future work here with our e-learning um, platform, which we're particularly proud of. But um, to start the day, um, I would like to introduce um, Nikki James, and uh, thank you very much for coming, Nikki. Good morning, and thank you. Welcome to all. And I feel very humbled to be opening up this Women's Health Showcase today. Galpa Gaka, Yori Yori Waka, welcome to Yori Yori Country. My name is Nikki James. I am a very proud Yori Yori woman. When we talk about Yori Yori people, we are made up of 16 family groups and eight clans. So I'll begin with my family group, which is Ada Cooper, and my clan is Moira. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land that we meet here today, the Yorta Yorta Nation. I pay my respects to my ancestors, my elders, past and present, and any other Aboriginal person here today. Also, I'd like to acknowledge any multicultural women that are seated in this room. Um, Australia, to me, is made up not only of Australians and First Nations people, but we are a multicultural country. So I acknowledge and respect any person who has a culture and makes their life here in Australia. So I welcome and acknowledge you all today as well. The Yorta Yorta people are made up of 16 family groups and eight clans. Moira, Bangarang, Kalithiban, Wilithika, Yilapana, Kwot Kwot, Yilabana Yilabana, and Yurai Ilamurang. Our totem is the long neck turtle. It's our protector, provider and guide. I'd also like to acknowledge the stolen generation. Those who have passed into the dream time, those who have found their way home, and those today who are still looking for their families. Strange enough, when I stand here today, um, I wear many hats, so let's start with me being a cultural officer and a ranger at Winton Wetlands. Standing here today being booked by the Yorta Yorta Nation. Being a full-time La Trobe University student, which I'm nine weeks away from graduating. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, in my cert for Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Management. So somewhere I find a lot of time for community and this year... I was asked to be seated for Women's International Day for the Shep City Council um, through the Flamingo Project. Now, before I became one of those um, four panellists, I had to weigh up, Does this, is this relevant for me? Am I worthy to sit on this seat in front of over 150 people that attended? And I was, because at 18, my brother, he was 14, took his own life this was 30 years ago because of his sexuality. So, you know, we're talking back in those times, so I'm a big advocate for pride, diversity. And this year, just to see that flashback from Women's International Day, um, that was huge for me to get up and stand up and talk about that. So, you know, even with equity over equality, there's been many access services that I couldn't, um, well, access due to the fact of my name and who I was. So, um, with all that said, as we walk in the footsteps of my ancestors, the First Nations people, I welcome you all here today to Yorta Yorta Country. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Um, 
just listening to your story, Nikki, there is, um, there's so much to every, each and every one of us. And what I am reflecting on at the moment is um, the, the, uh, the additional burden that our First Nations people are holding at the moment and are living through. And so I want to acknowledge that as well, Nikki. Thank you. And um, and as as Women's Health Gob and North East have, um, we have uh, said that we we've, after a, a considerable consideration, um, are supporting the yes vote in the upcoming referendum. And the reason that we I mean we consider all of these things that we're looking at, but one of the things that we wanted to consider was that we know that there are varied within the First Nations um, community there are varied feelings around. Um, around the voice and the vote. And for us, we recognise those and we um, also respect the differences of opinion and we um, support, um, uh, we respo support respectful conversation with this. And um, so, as I said, we're saying, we're saying yes and we understand that there's a lot of varied opinions there and I would encourage anyone, I imagine there are a lot of people in this room who have thought about this very deeply um, and if, if this is something that you need to think about, there's amazing resources out there and for us, it's listening to First Nations <coughs> voices to understand so that we can use our vote um, in the best possible way that we can. So, um, Nikki, thank you. Um, so today is pretty informal. Um, I would encourage you to explore our exhibits um, and to um, just to take it at your own pace. We've got morning tea. Um, we're going to have three um, conversations this morning up here on the stage. So um, we'll have the first one, a little break, second one, a little break third one, little break and lunch. Um, and as, for those of you that know me, I keep mentioning food because it's just really important. So, <laughs> so please, please enjoy the food. Um, so that brings me to our first presentation today. And um, our first presenter is Renata Lucas, the Regional Manager at Women's Health Goulburn North East. And many of you will have crossed paths with Renata during her nine year tenure with us. Um, Renata is going to present on our gender equity pathway. This pathway underpins the way we work across um, with organisations across our region, focusing on both common themes and what makes each organisation unique. So, Renata. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Nikki. Um, it's wonderful to be here um, and to start with our... Um, Gender equity pathway. So our this is going to be a presentation, um, an overview of one of the ways in which we do partnership work at Women's Health Goulburn North East. And the gender equity pathway is a one-to-one -one model of working individually with another organisation to build supportive structures and a comprehensive whole of workplace approach to gender equity. We could not do this and most of our other work without relationships. This is the heart of our connections across the region and beyond. So firstly, um, again, thank you so much, Nikki, to your, for your welcome. Um, and I'd just like to, to pause and personally um, reflect on a previous work, the Making Two Worlds Work um, project in 2006. Um, and the artwork on the screen here is Make Your Support for Aboriginal Communities a Reality Genuine and True. And a little bit about this artwork is that workers attending a 2006 forum about equity, culture and inclusion were invited to contribute their handprints to the poster. The artwork was then developed by an Aboriginal elder. The middle circle represents meetings and gatherings of health and community agencies. The outer circles symbolise different organisations and individuals working collaboratively to advance health and wellbeing in our area. And the lines signify the many links and networks. So I think it's a, a fitting way to start a presentation on um, partnerships and relationships. And partnerships have always been part of the way we work at Women's Health Goulburn North East. And I often also like to, to start by centering um, myself in our strategic plan. Um, 
and it always, always helps to connect to um, the pieces of work that we, we are doing um, in the larger whole. So our vision for 2021 to 2025 um, is that rural and regional women of all ages have optimal health and wellbeing. And to work towards this vision, um, in this strategic plan, we identified four roles. Um, and these have been articulated to enable us to demonstrate what our work looks like. And that can sometimes feel like a bit of a, a challenge to articulate the tangibles when we are working on long-term change. So these roles that are listed on, on the right side of the slide there are listening to our communities, leading advocacy that amplifies voices, collecting the evidence, and mobilising and empowering others. And as you might notice, all of these things require relationships and partnerships. None of them are isolated roles. They build upon one another to strengthen the overall approach. And as a women's health service that covers 12 local government areas of Goulburn Valley and North East Victoria, it's one fifth of our state, um, we have diverse regional cities, small rural towns, and it's impossible for um, a relatively small staffing team to physically reach and understand every individual facet of our region. This is where our partnerships are an important and critical part of ensuring that we remain on the ground and are then able to lift our gaze to identify the commonalities but also the unique features that can be further communicated at the statewide level. We are deeply situated in place. We are connected at the local level through our partnerships with health, local government, education and more. And it's so great to be able to, to share it um, with our partners today. And we are connected at the, local, at the statewide level, of course, through our Victorian Women's Health Services Network, other peak bodies and government. So I, I find that this is a really unique position um, that we, we're situated in, in that between at the regional level and it allows a continual feedback loop. So we're informing, we're trialling, we're evolving and we're adjusting to respond strategically to what's being implemented. So given that regional position, and the strategic roles that guide the way we work. Um, it's important to acknowledge that the, there's been a phased development of the pathway pro model, model over time. We have been doing partnerships for 30 years and often it's something that uh, has, has sat below the surface. It's kind of um, been a bit of an invisible process that um, has been able to then support the outward facing project outcomes. So prior to 2018, we started to think a bit more about this, this invisible nature of our partnerships, um, to explore it, articulate it. Um, when, we, when we say this is the way we work, um, what does that look like? So um, we, we use the words coaching, mentoring, facilitation, that whole wraparound approach. And we recognised while we were exploring this that um, often uh, we are most well known and have been historically for um, training delivery. Uh, and we identified that when we entered a conversation about how we could support an organisation, we were also looking at the broader environment for opportunities to embed that longer term change. So the Transformational Change Pathway was created and piloted in 2018. Um, it was our visionary way of working, which was based on best practice in gender transformative change at a time when there wasn't a mandate for organisations to work in gender equity. However, in 2020, we got the momentum shift that women's health services had been collectively advocating for with others, which was the Victorian Gender Equality Act. It directed public sector organisations to audit and implement action plans um, and it certainly has been a once in a generation opportunity to improve gender equality in Victoria. And since then, the gender equity pathway has been adapted to align more closely 
with the obligations of defined entities, including matching to the four-year action cycles. So essentially what our pathway model has been striving for is that gender equity becomes business as usual for workplaces. Any activities that are implemented by partners are con connected to a bigger strategy that filters across all levels of the organisation and engages a team approach to owning and implementing action. This is what will support sustainability of learning and be able to continually adapt as people move in and out of roles. For any of our pathway partnerships, building and maintaining an enabling environment is what will support growth. And we use the five pillars that have been, we've adapted from the Gender Equ the Equality Institute to break down what this looks like. So the first one um, starts with leadership commitment. An authorising environment is one of the greatest enablers, of course, that we have seen. The second one is embedding into existing processes. So where a gender equity lens can be apl applied across organisational processes and policies, then there will be greater connection and strengthening of a whole of organisation approach. Number three is systems of prioritising and decision making. So we can certainly feel um, it being daunting at first to have many listed activities and be unsure of where to start. Um, we can help to diffuse the sense of overwhelm by taking it step by step guided by internal expertise about what has worked in the past. Four is commitment to resourcing. That's both time and staff. Not only having one key role dedicated to implementing gender equity, but supporting a team approach to learn and do together. This is where the training element um, fits in. It is one part, as you can see, that contributes to the whole model. And that ongoing translation of learning then needs to be supported by all the other pillars for sustainability. And the last one there is accountability mechanisms. So the regular monitoring of activities, reporting back, leadership representation on advisory groups and opportunities to continually reflect and adapt. So you might be thinking these pillars are not necessarily anything new. Um, however, the importance is in ensuring that a balance of the pillars are being implemented at the same time to ensure a comprehensive and sustainable approach. For example, if we tilt the focus too much on individual training um, and are not also linking this back into our internal systems and processes, then the gains risk being lost. So the pathway is a dynamic model. It can continue to adapt and evolve. And we have some general steps and processes that guide us in, sitting up, in setting up a pathway, but it is no means a linear process. Our, we've got some steps up here, and the first one, our partnership checklist is aimed at providing information on the organisation. It gives us a bit of a pulse check about where they are, are currently at in terms of gender equity. And working with defined entities, um, the Gender Equality Action Plan has often been used to inform this checklist. The scoping conversation then allows us to gain greater insight into the organisational information provided in the checklist. The conversation covers the organisation's journey so far, what some of the immediate priorities are, and where Women's Health Global North East could best offer support. Then the partnering agreement is our formal joint commitment at executive level of both organisations who have demonstrated that we want to work in partnership for mutual benefit and that it will be a relationship guided by shared values. Based on all of the information collected, then we put together a partnership framework for action and that um, outlines the key areas of support that Women's Health Global North East can provide using the Gender Equality Action Plan as a guide. Um, types of activities that have been included in here include things like staff workshops, um, communi internal communication strategies and approaches, um, policy document re reviews. Um, and then we set up a process where we've got regular check-in meetings um, with both the lead and 2IC of both organisations to provide a point for reflection and progressing the framework. 
So as I'm sure you can appreciate, each pathway is a significant amount of time and resource commitment by both organisations. And given that we are a small team covering a large region, we are limited in, in how many path, individual pathways we can um, lead and support. Uh, over the years, we have explored the pathway with a number of organisations who have progressed along some of the steps, then for various reasons, um, impacted by changes in the enabling environment, haven't been able to continue. But we see the benefit of being in this region for so long is that we, if we have some a conversation and a connection that then a couple of years down the track may formulate into a more extensive partnership. So we recognise that there is that ebb and flow um, and, and we're okay with, with going at that pace. So since 2021, we have three signed and sustained partners, Mitchell Shire Council, Rural City of Wangaratta and Goulburn Ovens Institute of TAFE. And as we continue to build our capacity and skill set, um, particularly in the area of gender impact assessment support, um, we have been working um, closely with two more emerging opportunities um, in 2023, Murrindindi Shire Council and Indigo Shire Council. So um, you can see that our history of working with local governments across our region is being carried through here. This is where we have had most familiarity with context and processes of the sector. And the beauty of the pathway, I've found that it's a two-way learning process and we are branching into other sectors um, such as education and training and learning more about the path, how the pathway does or does not translate so easily and where um, modifications can be made along the way. And I've just put a few quotes up here of um, things that our, our partners have said to highlight the value of, of, the, part of the pathway. Um, so the formalised partnership has been an asset to the implementation of the Gender Equality Action Plan. The partnership keeps the work ticking along. This partnership will create clear accountabilities and clear focus going forward and some very good conversations have occurred. So the pathway beyond 2023, while we continue to be chameleons, we're listening, we're inquiring, we're testing, adapting, we're advocating and we're growing. For the year ahead, we're looking about maintenance, so supporting our current um, and emerging partnerships, delivering on joint activities and identifying some common themes that could be of value to focus on so that many defined entities in our region um, can, can be offered something um, that may not have capacity to enter into a full pathway right now. And always with a view to the long term, we are mindful of the next four year gender equality action plan cycle, which is coming up from 2025. So the theming and the information we're getting directly from our partners on the ground will help us to understand the role that we can play in region-wide implementation of gender equity. And we will continue to explore how we can be a resource for other sectors, um, particularly health services, which we have um, started to, to look at now, as we understand that there are unique considerations for how the Gender Equality Act can best be translated in this context. Um, I hope you're getting a sense that nothing we do is ever in isolation. So our pathway model is part of our workforce capacity building system. So there are a few other ways that um, Women's Health Global North East are supporting regional learning and gender equity for both organisations and individuals. And these, these are listed up here. So our Women's Health, Women's Health Global North East e-learning platform it's a range of self-paced online modules to work through and explore concepts associated with gender equity. And the Gender Equity Community of Practice, um, it's been a, a regular series of two hour online sessions where practitioners from across the region come together to reflect and apply diverse topics to their practice. We have one more session for the year in October on co-design. So be sure to um, check out more information on, on the stalls for both of these um, projects. And in finishing up, I'd just like to start where we began. Um, we could not do this and most of our other work without our relationships. It is truly the heart of our connections across our region and beyond. Um, 
And personally, it's, it's been one of the, the greatest things about working with Women's Health Golden North East. So I look forward to seeing where the next 30 years of partnership will take us. The heart of the work is, is our relationships and relationships are two-way things. There are the people in this room, there are our stakeholders and partners and individuals and organisations right across the region. And, um, you know, as, as Renata said, relationships ebb and flow. Sometimes they go really well. Sometimes, you know, we have a bit of a disagreement about things. Sometimes we're not quite on the same page. But the longevity of the work is the important piece here. We're here, we've been here for 30 years and as much as I'd like to say there is no need for us for the next 30 years, um, we're going to try and do ourselves out of a job if we can, um, but we're needed still and those relationships are needed still. So um, it is, it, thank you Renata for, for pulling all that together and starting off the day with, with the key part of our work. Thank you very much. Our next presentation is uh, around our project, Long Story Short. Um, and as, as uh, Catherine and Mary will talk to you about, it did start life as Storylines. It's just recently been renamed. And um, uh, so Catherine Kears and Mary Rema Anthony um, are our, two of our staff who've been working uh, on this project. And um, it's a key way for us to understand the sexual and reproductive health needs of women in our region. So I'm going to hand over to Catherine and Mary now. Good morning. It's so wonderful to be here today and showcase um, some of our key projects for you. Um, if you hadn't, haven't had a chance to visit our long story short, uh, reshaping the narrative of sexual and reproductive health table yet, um, please come on over after the presentations and we'd love to um, chat about anything we say. Um, so my name's Catherine. Um, I work in health promotion and communications. Um, and today my colleague Mary and myself, who also works in health promotion, um, are going to present a case study focusing on our long story short community advisory group sessions, um, which were held earlier in the year. <coughs> so, um, the long story short project, um, as its byline suggests, aims to reshape the narrative of women's sexual and reproductive health. Um, but what does this mean to reshape the narrative? The question at the core of this project is, based on the lived experience of women in our region, um, what does better look like? How can we draw out the solutions embedded in stories that women hold about their sexual and reproductive health and advocate for improvement? <coughs> so of course to do this, um, we needed to talk to our community. The first step in this process um, was the formation of the long story short, um, formerly Storylines, community advisory group, affectionately referred to by our team members as the CAG. Um, while we commissioned Bendigo Community Health to gather quantitative data um, and began scoping for research around sexual and reproductive health in our regions, um, for a literature review, we were keen for the three CAG sessions to be um, our first completed element of the project, um, to be able to embed community perspectives and co-design principles throughout all other facets of the Long Story Short project. In preparing for the CAG sessions, um, it was important to us to consider a number of factors. We wanted to recruit women from across both regions, that is the Goulburn Northeast uh, and the area covered by our partner organisation, Women's Health Lodden Mallee. And we knew early on that we wanted the participants to play a key role in informing the future elements um, of the project, including how we might present the quantitative research, how to frame our consultation with health professionals and the conduction of future focus groups. So in developing the communications for recruiting to the CAG, it was important to provide context to the project. Sexual and reproductive health can be a sensitive subject for some people, bringing up feelings of shame, embarrassment or trauma. Um, we wanted to ensure that the participants would be well prepared to provide informed consent both for what would be discussed in the sessions um, and what would happen to their de-identified information afterwards. We also paid careful attention to disseminating recruitment material, 
using a multi-pronged approach to communications channels um, was seen as crucial to including a broader demographic. We used a combination of social media, printable flyers and targeted emails to send the message out. We collated a list of various networks from the public health and community <coughs> sectors as well as um, aged care and uh, multicultural centres as well. And we asked them to distribute the emails and flyers to <coughs> their networks. So we also sent through the material to public libraries throughout the region, asking them to um, print flyers uh, to ensure that digital access and digital literacy wasn't a barrier or a limiting factor in being able to contribute. Some of the women's health staff also offered to take the flyers into community settings um, around the region on their travels. So when it came time to selecting CAG members from the expressions of interest, we used a range of filtering strategies um, to ensure that we would include a diversity of views and perspectives. Health professionals who applied were uh, definitely considered for membership, but also offered the opportunity to instead um, give their perspectives during our later health professionals consultation workshop. Um, considering some demographic information, allowed us to ensure that we didn't select a completely homogenous group um, within the community advisory um, sessions. So we considered location within the region, um, we considered age bracket, cultural background and indigeneity, gender identity, um, and just the answers to the questions um, that the applicants filled out with their expressions of interest about what motivated them to participate. So this is always a process we're working to um, improve, reaching um, voices from the margins, reaching everyone within the community um, to be able to give everyone a chance to contribute and let their voice be heard. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Mary um, and she's going to tell you a little bit about co-design and the community advisory group sessions. Thank you, Catherine, for providing that great overview. And thank you, everyone, uh, for coming and supporting us today. Uh, so as um, Catherine mentioned earlier, during the planning phase of uh, CAG, uh, the principles of co-design also played a crucial role. And this approach has actually fostered collaboration, innovation, and active involvement of various stakeholders and showing us the significance of collective input and um, shared decision making. And uh, most of us um, might have different understanding about co-design, but don't let the definitions deter you. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so this is, um, so this is how, uh, we applied the principles of co-design to our project. Um, we, um, we acknowledged, I'm sorry, I'm having a tech issue. Uh, so uh, we acknowledged power dynamics to ensure equitable inclusion and opportunities for all the CAG members and uh, building uh, social connection and Trust was central to our community advisory group uh, meetings and all the processes that we undertook. And we also used uh, several um, creative tools to encourage participation and inclusion and fostering an environment where ideas and perspectives could flourish. And also the members were provided with the opportunities for leadership, growth, and reciprocal knowledge sharing. So. So this takes me to uh, the, uh, this brings me back to what happened over the uh, course of three community advisory group sessions. So in the first uh, community advisory group session, our members identified six major themes impacting the sexual and reproductive health of our women in the regions. And this includes access, privacy and confidentiality, stigma, education, networking, and innovation. And um, in the second CAC session, uh, we continued our conversations um, around these themes, and also we uh, discussed various uh, quantitative data elements that stood out to the uh, members. And also, uh, then following which, uh, um, we also provided a capacity building uh, where 
we explored the concepts of storytelling, and um, which was which we would uh, use as a tool for advocacy and change. And following which, in the third community advisory group session, we uh, the community advisory group members uh, shared what they felt really important and what they valued the most uh, from attending our CAG sessions. And most of them, majority of them felt that it is, uh, the long story short project is f uh, focusing on the area of great need and um, they were all play, uh, pleased to be part of this session. And yeah, it was really uh, great to have different perspectives and ideas on board. So um, by uh, listening to uh, the community's concerns and experiences, um, we were able to gain a deep understanding of their unique needs. And one of the key outcomes of the community advisory group session was that they informed various other elements of our project. And one of these includes the health professionals consultation workshop and online survey. Uh, so the themes that emerged from our community advisory group session served as a structured framework uh, for our discussions with health professionals. So engaging with them actually allowed us to, sorry, engaging with them actually allowed us to um, understand, uh, how, like get a deeper understanding of how the community identified themes affect the clinicians and service providers at their workplace. And um, also uh, the themes identified by the community was uh, very useful for us to structure our literature review. So uh, our literature review um, helped us to answer some critical questions uh, related to the sexual and reproductive health um, in regional Victoria and we explored the what, how, and why of this issue, and helped us to gain a deeper, a deeper understanding about the social um, demographics of Lodden Mali and Goulburn Northeast region. And also, um, uh, like we were able to understand the unique uh, needs of the regional women and the barriers that's letting them not to get an optimal sexual and reproductive health. Uh, also, uh, the themes will help us to inform the focus group discussions, um, uh, which is scheduled for the next uh, two months. Uh, we will be having three sessions, uh, and you'll uh, get more information around those in our, um, on our table. And um, uh, within the focus group, we are hoping to uh, gain a better understanding of the narratives and ask the community about what an ideal world will look like for women. And envisioning that will help us to uh, inspire hope and aspirations. And um, uh, like we will also get, uh, will help us to understand what are the tailored interventions and strategies we need to uh, look forward to reach that vision where all women, uh, all the women, trans, gender diverse, and uh, non-binary people will have an equitable access to sexual and reproductive health, and they will have an optimal uh, sexual and reproductive well-being. So uh, with this, I'll uh, please invite Catherine again to provide a uh, information about how we adapt, the long story short project team adapts to the dynamic environment of sexual and reproductive health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. So Mary's notes just completely disappeared, by the way. She did amazing. <laughs> Let's see how I go. Um, <laughs> So throughout the course of the Long Story Short project, the team has had to remain adaptable in our approach to the way we work, um, but also in our expectations. So uh, sexual and reproductive health, as I'm sure some of you know, is a space at the moment that is rapidly gaining traction in the public political arena. Um, with things like the recent um, Senate inquiry into sexual and reproductive health um, access, um, and also the removal of red tape um, in accessing 
medical uh, terminations, um, informing our project in real time. So like any project which extends um, over a period of time, um, so a couple of years for the long story short project, um, circumstances can change and um, with the input of community forming such a key part of the project and its advocacy objectives, um, No, it's not going to do it. Okay, <laughs> and it's advocacy objectives. Um, sometimes people can give contributions that are surprising or unexpected, and it's really important that we um, take those on board and let them inform our project rather than putting uh, our own opinions or our own expectations on the community. And really, that is the beauty of um, community consultation and co-design, and it's really why we're doing it. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm going to finish up there. Um, and we have some focus groups happening, um, as Mary said. Um, so there's one on the 12th of October coming up in Shepparton. Um, there's information on our table if anyone wants to look into that. But if you don't want to come to a focus group or you can't make it, there's also um, uh, the opportunity to contribute your perspective online just through a, a questionnaire. So um, there's information around that on the table as well. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Um, and yeah, have a great day. <laughs>
um, in fact, multilingual health education workers, um, two in the Shepparton region and one in the Wodonga region to talk to women in language. So I'd like to introduce Bhakti Damala and Bhakti is going to come up and just, just take a moment to just talk briefly about why it's really important to have uh, in language education. And um, yeah, so thank you, Bhakti. Thank you, Amanda, for giving me an wonderful opportunity. First of all, I would like to thank you, each of you in the room, for trying to understanding my English. English is my fourth language, and I myself feel it is not a great, but I hope you are going to understand what I'm going to say. So first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Bhakti Mainali Damala, and myself came to Australia in 2009 as a refugee. And I have gone through all the system issues and barrier, and I engage with the multiple services to get supported. So I myself started working with the multicultural community since 2014 in the refugee clinic. My role was engaging with the refugee asylum seeker and international student to engage to the services. I speak few languages, Hindi, Sanskrit, English, and Nepali, and this is where I can support the women. We find like women when they migrate from their home country, they are kind of pictures like a triangle, and when they came here, they are safe understanding, it changed into kind of circle, and then system here is a rectangle. And now they are not fitting in anywhere, and always there is a gap and issue. No matter how much we try to help and engage with them, unless we can see from their lens, it is really difficult to understand. So when we work directly with those multicultural women, we find that it's a system barrier. And I want to share the Maya story. Maya is an Asian girl. She has three children, and the children are grown up. And then she fall in the issue with the family violence. But she is not safe to tell anybody. If she is not feeling safe within the family, there is no trust whether she can go and talk to the any services. Because of the language and system barrier, what she can talk and what she cannot share. But back home country, if women are very frustrated, they can share with the family, friend, doctor, and it's all remain confidential or it nothing action will be happen and the women will be again rebuild their confidence. But here, the system work differently. Just domestic violence <coughs> is just not okay. So people need to react or do something to save that women. So the women reported to the GP and go to the police and some few cases happening and each time the women is very overwhelming, the blood goes very high and she's saying the different story. Service provider feel really confused what her real story is and what service she really want to. And the women get frustrated because each person when go and talk, they're asking the same question repeatedly. So if she know the system, how it's work, she wouldn't be in it like she is separated from family and children are taken away and she has so difficulty. Because of the system barrier, she is having lots of issue and go to the mental health. So multicultural women have lots of health issue in general because generally they don't talk about it. For example, breast screening, mammograms or putes, health assessment, this is not something Interested because they never do in their culture unless they are in a pain or in suffering really badly. That's the point when they see the health persons or seek the medical help. But here, this is really important that impact their life. So there is a lot, lot of area that we can work together and there is some gap with we have to work on it, but it's not easy fix. It is a system. This problem is a part of one jigsaw puzzle. We need a whole lot of parts to put together to fix it. This is my understanding and experiencing. That's what I understand. And thank you very much. That's all from me today. Thank you.
um, the women program is is really dear to our heart and um, we really appreciate having really skilled workers like Bhakti working with us. Thank you. So I am uh, really, really pleased to um, be launching um, our Care Through Disaster Report. Um, so you've just got me and in a moment, we will also have Dr Millie Rooney from Australia Remade, who through the magic of the internet um, will be, it's a video of her, she will be up here soon as well. So um, I wanted to give you just a tiny bit of background um, as to why we did this report. And um, it is, um, I, I guess many of you will have known the work that we've done um, through the Gender and Disaster Pod. So for those of you that don't know it, an extremely brief sort of history of the Gender and Disaster Pod is that um, after the uh, 2009 bushfires, um, <coughs> It basically, it was observed that there was an increase in the uh, rates of family violence after the fires. And so um, two of our staff decided to start to investigate this. And this became a 10-year project. And uh, through that work, and you can see uh, on our gender and disaster table just over here, um, you can see um, the, the background reports that were written, extensive work, and that work has informed not only uh, Victorian policy, but national policy, and has also gone overseas as well, nationally. So the work looked at why does this happen? What is the impact? What impact does gender have on how you prepare for, live through and recover from disaster. And the, um, the work has been um, evolved and uh, in 2016, the Gender and Disaster Pod, um, which is a partnership or was a partnership between Women's Health in the North um, and Monash University Disaster Resilience Initiative, MUDRI, um, and of course Women's Health Goulburn North East was formed. And so that work continued, the research continued, and what it evolved into was um, a, a deeper understanding of how, as I said, the, the drivers of family violence and how they're exacerbated through disaster. So in uh, 2021, um, the Gender and Disaster Pod, well, we were approached by the national, uh, the federal government, who um, have now funded for four years the what is now Gender and Disaster Australia uh, to deliver training in understanding this right across Australia. So not just in Victoria, but right across Australia. So from our regional little regional area here, we've got this influence and impact right across Australia in understanding this work. And when I say we, that's not just about Women's Health Goldman North East, that's about all of the partners, all of the people, all of the people who have um, contributed to that work over the years. So whilst Deb Parkinson and Claire Zara commenced that work and after Claire's um, death, Deb continued with that work. There's been a number of people that have um, influenced that and of course there's been different funding, different government departments as well as local people and local organisations that have contributed to it. So um, that brings us to today. And um, of course, you will be aware of the floods that we experienced. And um, through that, we were funded by the Department of uh, Families, Fairness and Housing and the Office for Women um, to look at prevention activities. Um, and it sort of sounds weird to talk about prevention activities after a disaster, but prevention has a very, um, has a broad spectrum. And of course, you can prevent something from happening again as well. So the funding was for us to, um, to support women in our region to connect, to, to improve their health and wellbeing after the disaster and to see how we can support them to foster more connections, um, to foster more support for each other. And so um, it was the 
funding was very flexible for us. It was quite a short time period. We had seven months to deliver the projects. Um, but it was very flexible. And one of the things that we wanted to do was make something that could support us in our thinking and in our work ongoing. And so the Care Through Disaster Project was, uh, was formed. And um, in fact, um, it was actually Lauren, one of our staff members, who said, what if we thought about centering care when we are thinking about disasters? Let's not just think about um, how we react. Let's not just think about the mechanics of it, but how can we centre care in this? And so that led us to working with Australia Remade and uh, on this particular project, but we've been working with Australia Remade since uh, 2020 when they looked at their um, public good report. And um, we were part of the consultations for that because they wanted to reach out to as many people in Australia and talk about um, to understand what is the public good, what sort of future do we want for Australia and what do we want for ourselves in that. So um, they did these wonderful consultations right across the country and we thought these are the people that we want to work with to think about centering care through disaster. So one of the things you can look at some of the previous work that we've done during this year, and given that um, last night was our AGM, we re did a reflection on the year itself, and um, we did a project with Australia Remade called Regions Remade, and you can see that on our website. There's a number of conversations, uh, blog posts, there are um, uh, podcasts as well that you can have a listen to, so you can really hear that work and how it's evolved. So. To today, um, I'm really pleased to say that we have the Care Through Disaster Report. Um, there are some cards there with QR codes. These are This literally was finished five days ago. So we got it to the printer and we said, print as many as you can, please. Um, so there are not a lot of them on the table, but there are executive summaries in your show bags, which I'm hoping you will take uh, when you're ready to leave. Um, and that links you to the website with the full report on it. This isn't the end of the report this is the beginning of the work and what we're wanting to do over the next few months um, and as long as we possibly can is continue to work with Australia Remade to understand how we can put this work into practice so that whenever we're thinking, whenever we're, in fact, every day, let's centre care. I mean, seriously, who does not want to be cared for? Who does not want to care for others? Um, who does not want to live in a more caring world? And for me, this is what health promotion and primary prevention is all about. It's imagining the world that we want and creating it. So we hope that this report will go a little way towards imagining a world that has more care in it. So I am, as I said, I'm going to uh, now introduce you to Dr Millie Rooney, who was hoping to be here today, and she is going to uh, give you a little idea as to why she wasn't here today. Thanks so much, everybody, for having me here. I'm Millie Rooney. I'm the co-director of Australia Remade. And it's my great pleasure to be able to speak with you today about our work on care through disaster. I'm not in the room with you physically, you might have noticed, uh, because I'm at home with care duties this week. And I have a husband with a chronic illness and often find myself negotiating around when I can be places and when I can't because of his health. So it always cuts a little bit close to home when I want to talk about care and find myself a little bit hobbled by my responsibilities. So apologies for not being in the room with you. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Muanina people in Lutruwita, Tasmania, and I pay my respects to Palua, the Palawa community and their elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. And I, before I talk about care through disaster, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that the First Nations communities around the world actually have been caring for community and country and each other uh, for millennia. And in the last several hundred years have been doing it through the disaster, the ongoing disaster of colonization. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. I think it's really important we sit with that and hold that. Uh, as we think about uh, oncoming disasters that are affecting the nation. So 
We had the privilege of working with Women's Health Goulburn Northeast on this project around, well, what does it look like for people to be cared for during disaster? We know disaster is happening. We know that we are going to see an increasing amount of climate crisis events, uh, whether that's floods, uh, fires, pandemics, etc. I know that your communities have experienced a lot of this recently. And, and we know that that is going to become increasingly normal. Uh, and it's scary, right? Um, I don't want to think about that kind of future. And so part of this work around care is to say, well, what does it look like to make that future something that is okay? <laughs> something that we get through together and something we take seriously. Care is something we take seriously through these strange times. Uh, I want to say that a lot of this work is, has been done by my colleague, Rachel Hay. She's not here with us today, uh, but she's responsible. she has done the huge amount of work of talking to people across the community, of pulling the work together, um, and I just want to acknowledge her role in that. I'm not going to tell you the details of the report. I'll leave that as a, a nice thing for you to do over a cuppa, but I want to talk about how this work has been about expanding the scope of how we think about disaster how we think about preparing for it, surviving through it and recovering from it. And we've done this thinking about, well, how do we do it together? And what does it mean to centre care when we are preparing for disaster, surviving it and recovering? And we tend to have a model of efficiency when we think about disaster, uh, which is great, right? We need, we need that. We need to understand, you know, okay, we're having a disaster. How do we get X many people out as fast as possible? How do we get supplies and resources in as fast as possible? How, efficiency is perfect for this moment. But efficiency isn't what makes us human and isn't how we survive and thrive as a community. And we need to make sure that we are paying as much attention to the complexity of community and care in the months before and after, months and years before and after disaster, and that we are resourcing our communities to be cohesive and connected, and that we value that as essential infrastructure for surviving and thriving through disaster. So, the, you know, very quickly in our work, we know that care for people to be cared for uh, around disaster, they need to be seen. So really seen as individuals and as communities and understood because when you know someone, when you see someone, you can care for them in a much, much better way. Um, people need to be safe. You know, we need to be preventing disasters. That came through very strongly. Uh, it's, it's all very well to have the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, but what's going on up the top? Uh, so we need action on climate change. We need to plan our communities and manage our communities in a way that when disaster does hit, because it will, uh, we are not exacerbating that. And that's both in terms of the physical landscape, but also making sure, you know, before a kind of critical moment, sudden disaster happens like a fire or a flood, are people in the community housed already? Do they have access to you know, the resources, financial and otherwise, that they need. Having people in community already safe and secure is disaster preparation. Uh, and we need people to be supported to care for their communities, whether that's through physical infrastructure of safety equipment, fire trucks, uh, evacuation centres. Uh, we need people to be supported to, you know, build community, uh, to have community events, to have fun events, to, to enjoy life. Uh, and we need government to really step in. Communities are known to be the kind of backbone of disaster response, but they're tired. And we, we need to be better supporting those people living through this uh, to, to care for each other. Uh, and the thing that I think has really struck me about this work is that Preparation is, is not about fear, you know. Uh, Rebecca Solnit has this amazing book called A Paradise Built in Hell, and she talks about how from disaster we build strong community connections that bring us together, and, and people value that moment. You know, the disaster is awful, but the strong community is this sort of beautiful paradise that comes through. And basically what we're arguing is that's great, wonderful, let's take what we can get from any kind of disaster but that actually we can build the paradise first and that reduces the experience of hell. And so we need to start seeing community connection, the time it takes for us to have a coffee with our neighbours, volunteering at the library, um, joining the CFA, hosting an arts festival, bringing community together. We need to invest in that 
And we need to trust that that is disaster pre preparation infrastructure and recovery. And, and everyone who's had firsthand experience, particularly of the recovery, really understands this. And it's gendered, you know. Uh, we tend to see that kind of work as a bit fluffy, not that important, something women do on the side. Um, it's essential. And we need to be creating communities with resourcing and policies that say, no, community time is valuable and we're going to invest in that. You can have a look at the report for some of our suggestions there, but I'm talking big picture things like universal basic income, like uh, four day work week, like volunteer leave, uh, paid volunteer leave. Anything that we can do that says your time building connections in your community is important and, and we're going to resource that. So I'd love to talk to anyone who's interested. Um, please do get in touch. Please have a read of the report. And just a huge thank you to Women's Health Goulburn Northeast for making this possible. It's such a joy and delight to get to work with an organisation um, that takes this big picture work and puts it in place. It's, it's really um, quite unusual, I think, and, yeah, quite a pleasure to work with. So thank you so very much. One of the things for me out of this is... This is what we're doing, us being in the room, talking together, making connections um, is, is a key part of the work. And, and as Millie said, it's often seen as fluffy. It's often seen as something, you know, that just women do and it's, you know, there. And we all know that, that this is the key work that we need to do. Um, and we, we all know, all of us in this room, no matter our gender, we all know that this is really important work. Um, and so it, it is a privilege to be in an organisation that has been going for this long, that, that is doing this work. And we want to continue to centre this work. We want to continue to ensure that this, imp this important work is being done every day. Um, so I want to thank you all for being here. Um, I want to thank you all for, for uh, taking the time and, and spending it with each other. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing that you're doing. Thank you so much. And, you know, it'd be really dull if I was just sitting in the room talking to myself. So it is just lovely to have all of you here. We can't do this work without you. So thank you so much. Thank you.